And here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. The power of Jesus is enough to change any heart. I believe there is no sin so strong, no temptation so powerful, no force so great that it cannot be overcome by God's transforming grace. Somebody say amen. It was a beautiful sunny day on Tuesday, May 10th, as a small Cessna 208 plane flew across the Atlantic Ocean from the Bahamas to Florida, USA. Pilot Kenneth Allen was at the controls that day, and everything was proceeding smoothly as the plane neared the coast of Florida. But suddenly, Kenneth started feeling ill. His head was pounding and his vision began to blur. He told his passengers he wasn't well, and the next thing he knew, Kenneth Allen had passed out. Without any warning, the small airplane was flying high above the earth without any pilot at the controls. Worst of all, no one else on the plane had ever flown an airplane before. The passengers tried to revive pilot Kenneth Allen, but he'd gone unconscious due to a sudden tear in his heart valve. Without a pilot, without any way to land the plane, it seemed that the passengers were doomed to die. As the pilot lay slumped in his seat, the airplane began to nose dive out of the air. Passenger Darren Harrison knew nothing at all about airplanes, but he knew that if he didn't get help, the plane would crash and everyone on board would be killed. So Darren Harrison did the only thing he could do. He got on the radio and called, help! And by the grace of God, an air traffic controller responded. I don't know how to fly a plane, Darren cried. But then the voice of the air traffic controller came back with a message of hope and reassurance. Gradually, step by step, the man at the airport guided Darren Harrison through the process of flying the airplane. And miraculously, at 2.37 p.m., Darren Harrison safely landed the airplane at Palm Beach Airport. When all hope was gone, when everything the passengers were trusting in was taken away, God intervened and brought them to safety. Darren had no idea how to fly an airplane. Survival was out of his reach, but it was not unreachable. Darren Harrison called for help, and the impossible became possible. When a superior outside force stepped in, Darren landed the plane safely. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the miraculous story of Darren Harrison and the safe landing of the Cessna 208 plane in Florida on May 10th. Just like Darren, every one of us is in an impossible situation. We all have a need that we cannot meet on our own. No matter who you are or how talented or intelligent or wealthy you are, none of us have the ability to save ourselves. None of us can change our lives from sin to righteousness. God commands us to be righteous, but we're unable to attain the righteousness he demands on our own. For the Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory. But through the grace and mercy of God, Jesus has come to make a way for us. Through his blood, we can become righteous. Through his power, we can live righteous and live holy lives that please God and bring him glory. That's the message in our sermon today, a sermon titled, The Truth About Righteousness. We're going to discover God's desire to change us from sinners to saints, and we're going to learn how that transformation takes place. But before we learn more, let us bow our heads and pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we come before you in the name that is above every name, the only way to the Father, the only way of salvation, the name of Jesus. And we ask you to have mercy upon us today. For though we've sinned, O oh Lord, show us the way back. Though we've sinned, show us the way to righteous living. We submit to you now, we bind every voice of the devil that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit, the power to speak to us and change us, the power to bring your own name glory through our transformed lives. We thank you today by faith that you're going to move in our midst and change us 
and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I want to invite you to take a moment right now. Put your hand on your chest. Join your faith with mine and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Truth For Today. I'm so glad that you're here today to receive the Word of God. And I believe God is going to use it to bring about change in your life. See, you're not here by accident today. God brought you within my voice so that His Word would make a difference in your life. For the truth is, God's Word changes us. God's Word is like an eternal spiritual seed that goes down deep in our hearts. And when that seed takes hold in us, it brings forth new life. It brings forth eternal life in us. For God has sent His Word to us today so that we can receive His life and be transformed. If you believe it, say amen. That's why this month, we're getting into God's Word like never before. God's Word has the power to change us. It gives us life and makes us whole. But God's Word won't work if it's not part of our lives. So this month, we're rededicating ourselves to a living Word encounter so we can learn and grow and change. We began this series two weeks ago with the foundational message on the Bible. Here at Truth For Today, we believe the Bible from cover to cover. And we even believe the cover when it says, Holy Bible. We believe God's Word is the truth, without error and without end. We believe all our decisions, directions, and dreams must be submitted to God's Word. For only in His Word can we know the truth. That's why for every doctrine every discussion about lifestyle, we must first ask ourselves, is that in the Bible? Last week, we examined one of the greatest misconceptions in the world today. That is the lie that says there are many ways to God. A lot of people believe that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. But the Bible gives us a completely different truth. According to God's word, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Jesus is who he says he is. He rose from the dead and is unique in all of history. He was fully man and is fully God, and we can trust him to save us. And that topic now brings us to this week's sermon. See, if Jesus is who he says he is, then that fact has implications for you and for me and how we should live. If Jesus is God, then he has every right to demand our full obedience and allegiance. If Jesus is the only way to heaven, then we must listen to him and obey him and surrender completely to him. For the fact is, when Jesus said, follow me, he was calling us not just to be saved, not just to go to heaven. He was calling all of us to walk in his footsteps and live the way he lived. That's the truth we find in our scripture text today. You'll find our scripture text at the top of your sermon notes. Your notes are available free of charge from my website and all my social media platforms. So I invite you to take out your sermon notes now as we discover the story of a man who was just like you and me, but he had an encounter with Jesus. And when he met Jesus, his life was changed. He went from sinner to saint, from unrighteous to righteous. So let's follow his story and see how it happened and how we too can make the same change in our lives. Our text for today is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 19, 1 to 10. Now receive the word of the Lord. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he'd become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four 
times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. I want you to stop and think for a moment today with me about the change in the life of this man. It's a story of total transformation. He went from a sinner to a saint. He went from being a thief to being generous. He went from being far from God to being praised by God. This was a change more far-reaching and consequential than any other change known to man. For you see, Zacchaeus experienced God's grace. He experienced the love and peace and joy and forgiveness that only comes from Christ Jesus. And when he did, he went from outcast to included. He went from sinner to saint, from darkness to light, from death to life. His heart was made new. His sins were forgiven. And Zacchaeus became a righteous man. But not only did Zacchaeus experience internal change, the internal change resulted in a dramatic external change that was visible. The grace he experienced transformed his entire life and conduct. He became a righteous man both inside and outside. And the great news for all of us today is that we can all experience this same transformation when we understand the truth about righteousness. So let's look at the life of Zacchaeus today and discover three truths about righteousness. And here's your first truth today. Righteousness is beyond my reach, but it is not unreachable. Listen to what the Bible says in Luke 19.3. He was too short to see over the crowd. Now, that may not seem important to you, but in that short sentence, we see a problem that all men face. There are barriers between man and the righteousness of God. What were the barriers in Zacchaeus' path to Jesus? First, there were internal barriers. The Bible says in verses 2 and 3, Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector in the region, and he'd become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. Zacchaeus was too short to see Jesus. The man literally had shortcomings. You know, friends, I'm a tall man, but I don't have anything against short people. Some of my best friends are short people, and there's a special promise in the Bible for all short people. It's when Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. He's with the low. So if you're short today, take heart. Jesus is with you. But seriously, his size was a barrier. He couldn't see Jesus. And this fact represents something to us. It's a symbol. God is trying to tell us something here. He made Zacchaeus short so that his small size would represent something to us. For the fact is, no matter who you are or how hard you try, we all fall short of God's righteousness. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.10, all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. And when you fall short of God's standard, you can't spend your way out. You can't write a check to purchase forgiveness of sins. You cannot meet somebody at the government office and pay a bribe to get to heaven. No matter how you dress, you can't cover your sin. No matter how high you rise in society, you can't rise high enough to meet God. No matter how good you look, you can't make your own heart pure. Righteousness is beyond our reach. And the problem is not just internal barriers. There are external barriers too. Listen to verse 7. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. See, Zacchaeus faced external barriers as well. Not only was he inadequate, not only was he a sinner, but his reputation prevented him from serving God. He didn't fit the pattern of a righteous man. So the people excluded him. And that's the second barrier to God's righteousness. People's expectations for external behavior. See, the crowd said, you've got to work harder. You've got to be nicer. 
You've got to do what men approve. And that's what the world will tell you that you must do in order to be righteous. If you can just do better, they will tell you, then you can please God. But friends, the fact is this, all your good works are never enough. For the Bible says in Galatians 3, 10 and 11, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. So it is clear that no one, no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. In fact, your good works, your prayers, your gifts, your efforts to please God are actually a barrier to righteousness. When you focus on your good works, you turn away from the righteousness that comes by faith alone. You focus on the external, but you neglect the internal. When you're living to please God through your works, you're actually living for the applause of people, and God opposes that. That's why Jesus said in Luke 16, 15, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Many years ago in China, there lived a great emperor who loved music. This great ruler had a very big orchestra, and he hired many, many musicians full-time to play for him. One day, a certain man wanted to get a position in the orchestra, so he bribed his way in as a flute player, even though he could not play a single note on the flute. Whenever the group practiced or performed, he would hold his flute against his lips, pretending to play, but not making any sound. He received a salary and enjoyed a comfortable living. But then one day, the emperor requested a solo from each and every one of the musicians. Well, the man who was the fake flutist got nervous. There wasn't enough time to learn the instrument. So he pretended to be sick, but the royal physician wasn't fooled. On the day of his solo performance, the imposter took poison and killed himself. The explanation of his suicide led to a phrase that found its way into the English language. He refused to face the music. And today, you can pretend to be a part of God's orchestra by just blending in with the crowd and going through the motions. Today, no one might notice you. Today, no one might know that you are not genuinely righteous in your heart. You say the right things, you carry the right Bible, you wear the right clothes, you go to the right places, and you hang out with the right people. You can enjoy the comfort of being accepted by the crowd of your choice. But there will come a day when you must face the music. One day you will be separated from everything and everyone. One day you will stand alone, naked before God, and give an account of your life and your decisions. Did you appear righteous externally only, or did you possess true righteousness in your heart? Did you act in a way that made everyone think you were a good person, or were you truly born again from your heart? You can look at these two barriers to righteousness and think it's hopeless. Internally, you're prevented from being righteous by your sin. Externally, you're prevented from being righteous because you can't do enough good works to earn God's favor. You may even be deceived into thinking that you can never be righteous. Yet there is a path to righteousness. Righteousness is beyond my reach but it is not unreachable. It's not unattainable. We can become righteous because Jesus makes a way for us. See, that's what happened to Zacchaeus. Our story continues in verse 5. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. And suddenly, in the midst of his separation from God, in the midst of his sin, in the midst of his disdain by the crowd, Jesus stops by his tree and calls him by name. He didn't call him because he was good. He didn't call him because he was worthy. Jesus called him in his sin to make 
him holy. And that's what Jesus always does. For in Matthew 9, 12 to 13, the Bible says, Jesus said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. For I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And Jesus came to where Zacchaeus was. Jesus overcame the barriers, and he will do the same for you. He will reach you right where you are, not where you should be. He will reach you in your sin, but he wants to bring you out and bring his righteousness to you. You're not too short. You're not too sinful. You're not too far from God. For Jesus is coming to save you today. When you're at the end of the rope, it's time for Jesus. When you can't, he can. When others won't, he will. And your life may be far from God today. You may be too short to see Jesus. You may be stuck behind the crowd. You may be a despised outcast. You may be a success in business, but a failure at home. You may be rich in money, but poor in peace, but you are the one Jesus came to call. He didn't come for the whole. He came for the broken. He didn't come for the happy. He came for the hurting. He came to save you and change you and set you free. Somebody say, he came for me. For you see, that's why Jesus came. He came to reach you in your sin and make you righteous. He came to take the worst sinner amongst us and make us righteous. Some people say, oh, we can never be righteous, but that's not true. Jesus came to redeem you at your worst so that you could live in righteousness. That's the powerful truth we find in Luke 1, 68 to 75. Praise the Lord, the Bible says, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He sent us a mighty Savior so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And God wants you to know today, he sent us a Savior named Jesus so that we could live in righteousness all our days. He didn't send us a Savior just so we could get to heaven. He didn't send us a Savior just to make our life on earth better. He sent us a Savior so that the righteousness that is beyond our reach would suddenly become reachable. Jesus came to make you righteous. That's why he said in John 16, 10, righteousness is available because I go to the Father. And that brings us to our second truth today. Righteousness is a free gift that requires my response. Listen again to Luke 19, 6. Zacchaeus quickly took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. And here we see the beginning of his breakthrough. Zacchaeus refused to allow the barriers to keep him from Jesus. And listen, friends, here's the truth we all need to pack up and take home with us today. Righteousness is a free gift. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn it or work for it. But you can put yourself in a position where you are a candidate to become righteous. That's what God tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So the Bible says clearly that you can't take credit for grace. It's not a reward. You don't earn it. You can't boast about it. But look carefully at the beginning of verse 8. It says, you receive this grace when you believed. So faith is the open window through which grace flows. Faith is the bridge that makes a way for grace to enter. For the last 22 years, I've been blessed to operate a children's home here in my homeland of Ghana. I've been so blessed over the years to raise many children for Christ. I love all the kids God has brought to us, but I've also learned that some children put themselves in a place to be closer to me and receive more love than the others. Jeff is one of those boys. Jeff came to our home when he was just an infant in arms. As a child, Jeff was particularly close to me. Anytime I would visit the home, he would always follow me closely. No matter where I went or what I did or where I turned, I would look and see Jeff right by my side. 
Other children would come to greet me and then go and play. Others would come to greet me and go and eat. But Jeff would not leave my side. He would stay right by me. He would look up at me and smile at me and follow me and hold my trouser leg and hold my hand. And his proximity would always attract my attention. His expectation aroused my sympathy. His smile melted my heart. And I would end up giving him my attention, my sympathy, and my heart more than anyone else. Jeff didn't deserve a gift. He didn't earn it. There was nothing he'd done to get special grace. But his response to me brought a greater response from me. And that's how it is with God. Coming near to him, waiting on him, praising him, loving him. All these draw God's attention to your life. And God wants you to reposition yourself today so that you are in a place of grace. If you'll begin to seek righteousness, you'll receive the gift of righteousness. If you'll begin to hunger and desire for righteousness more than anything, you will become a righteous person. That's why over and over the Bible tells us to chase after righteousness. 1 Timothy 6.11 says, pursue righteousness. Tell your neighbor, pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness and a godly life. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. And if you will begin to seek God and his righteousness, he's going to pour out righteousness on you. You're going to move to a new level of holiness. Your life will be a living testimony to the power and the grace of God. See, friends, God has provided everything we need to be righteous. Jesus shed his blood so we could be righteous as he is. He has a robe of righteousness to place on us. But you can't just sit and wait for righteousness to fall from heaven. Even though righteousness is a gift from God that we can never earn, it's still something you have to desire, you have to pursue, you have to chase after. For God will not force righteousness on any of us. Today, there is an error in some churches. Some churches teach that God does all the work and we just sit and receive. And there's no doubt that God does everything. He does what we cannot do. He makes us clean and washes our stains and makes us new. No amount of work or money or service or prayer could wash away the stain of our sin. Without the blood of Jesus, we would never be righteous. But you have a part to play. You have to hunger for it. You have to desire it. You have to seek righteousness. You have to reach out and receive it by faith and let it take over your life. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 24 to 30, put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Don't sin by letting anger control you. If you're a thief, Quit stealing. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. So God begins by telling us to put on righteousness. Then he tells us what that means. It means stop lying. Stop letting anger control you. Stop stealing. Stop using foul and abusive language. Stop bringing sorrow to God by the way you live. You may feel today that I don't have the strength to live righteous. But if you will commit your life to Jesus and stay in his word, he will give you the strength and the grace to live a righteous life. For God gives the power, but we have to give him the opportunity to work in us. Let me tell you the story of a Christian woman who learned this lesson. Once there was this Christian woman, she was married, but the marriage was in trouble. For the sake of privacy, we'll call her Sarah. Things seemed to have lost their glimmer and sparkle. The marriage was getting stale. They rarely talked. The husband traveled frequently. When he was at home, he was too tired to talk, too tired to help, too tired for anything. At the same time, a single man living in the house next door started showing an interest in Sarah and her family. We'll call him Robert. He would always smile at her and greet her. He seemed to really care about her. They started talking and they became close. Sarah shared her problems with Robert 
and they cried together and laughed together. He would talk to her about his challenges at work, and he seemed to really listen to her when she advised him. In fact, the man seemed to be a dream come true. He seemed so good compared to her own useless husband. Her own husband never listened to her. He didn't seem interested in her problems. He'd grown fat and was no longer attractive, especially compared to Robert. Robert was strong and fit and handsome and always such a gentleman. But even more than that, Robert loved Sarah's three children. When their dad was gone, Robert would often come and take them out to buy chicken and rice or take them to the mall or the kiddie park. He seemed to really care about the children, unlike her husband, who barely spoke to the kids. Well, one day her husband traveled. That night, Sarah put the children to bed and was alone in her room preparing for sleep when a knock came on her door. She went to the parlor, turned on the light, and opened the door and found Robert standing there. He told her he'd come to check on her and to say goodnight to the children. But Sarah knew there was more. She stood at the door talking with him, and her heart was racing. What would she do? Then Robert said, I want to go in and say goodnight to the children. And he came into the house. He looked deep into her eyes. Then he walked down the hallway to the bedroom where the children slept. Robert went into the dark bedrooms and waited. Sarah was standing in the light of the parlor, and she had a choice. If she followed Robert into the dark bedroom, she knew what would happen. She would fall into adultery. No one will ever know, she thought. The darkness will cover my sin. The children are asleep. My husband's gone. But then the voice of the Holy Spirit spoke to her. Stay in the light, he said. If she stayed in the light, nothing evil would happen. In the light, she was safe from sin. In the light, temptation would not touch her. In the light, sin could not occur because it would be exposed. For a long time, Sarah stood there in the light. Robert waited in the dark. But when Sarah never followed him into the darkness, he finally came out, said goodnight, and left without even looking back. He never returned to visit her again. And from that moment on, Sarah decided that the best way to save her marriage was to stay in the light. She started going back to church. She started praying and reading her Bible. She started talking to her husband. And as she walked in the light, her marriage was restored. A new love grew within her and her husband. The darkness may seem tempting to you, but I say to you today, stay in the light. The darkness may be calling you. The darkness may tell you that you can hide your sin. No one will know. No one will discover. But the light offers you safety and protection. Don't go down the corridor of darkness. Stay in the light. Put yourself in the position where you can live a righteous life. And that brings us to our third truth about righteousness. Righteousness comes by faith and results in right living. The powerful conclusion of our story comes in verse 9. Listen to what happens when Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' home in verses 8 to 10. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Look at the transforming power of grace in Zacchaeus' life. He went from cheater to giver. He stood up and said, I'm going to pay back four times what I stole. I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. He didn't just talk about Jesus. He became like Jesus. He didn't just say a sinner's prayer and keep living in sin. He left the sinner's life and changed direction. Now, I believe in the transforming power of God's righteousness in this man's life. The power of God's grace changes him. He receives righteousness by faith and becomes right in the way he lives. And here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. The power of Jesus is enough to change any heart. I believe there is no sin so strong, no temptation so powerful, no force so great that it cannot be overcome by God's transforming grace. Somebody say amen. 
If you have a defect in your body, you'll correct it. Men go to great lengths to correct malfunctions in the body. If you have poor eyesight, you go to the eye clinic and get eyeglasses. There's even surgery to correct bad eyesight. You can have fat removed, eyebrows changed, cheeks raised, lips made fuller. You can have your buttocks reduced and your skin bleached. You can change the way you look. If you have a defective knee, they can do surgery and replace the old one with a new one. They can transplant a kidney. They can transplant a heart. God says to you today, it is easier for the Almighty to remove sin from your heart than it is for a human doctor to remove cancer from your body. It is easier for the Almighty to cleanse your soul than it is for a physician to cleanse your wounds. For he's the God who made you. He formed you and fashioned you and breathed life into you. He knows you in and out. Nothing is too hard for him. Men change defects in their bodies. How much more is God capable of changing defects in your spirit? For when God comes in and changes you, it becomes evident to the whole world. When Jesus robes you in righteousness, it always results in right living. Listen, friends, some people today believe a lie that goes like this. When God sees me, he doesn't see me, he sees Jesus. In other words, it doesn't matter what I do as long as I believe in Christ. If I pray to sinner's prayer and I've asked Jesus into my heart, then I can live however I like and Jesus forgives my past, present, and future sins. But friends, that's not in the Bible. In fact, listen carefully to the truth of 1 John 3, 7. Do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Righteousness isn't just a theory. It results in real life change. Righteousness isn't just a doctrine. It results in righteous living. And the truth is, when God sees you, he sees you. The Bible never says when God sees you, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. In fact, the Bible says we will be judged for everything we do, every act, every thought, every word. In fact, the Bible says every act you commit is written in a book of remembrance. So how can you say God doesn't see me? The truth today is this. If you truly, fully give your life to Christ, you will be changed. The power to transform you comes from God, but the choice to change must come from you. For Romans 6 says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. That's the lesson we learned from the true testimony of an American man named Joshua Broom. Joshua Broom was a 22-year-old actor struggling to make ends meet, living in Los Angeles, California, when he was offered an opportunity to star in a pornographic movie. You'll be famous, the agent told him. You'll be rich, and you'll get to have sexual pleasure while you work. It sounded like a dream come true. So Joshua accepted the offer and starred in his first pornographic movie. At first, he told himself he would only do it once, take the money, and then quit. But the lure of the money and the pull of the flesh took him back again and again. In fact, Joshua Broom starred in over 1,000 pornographic movies. Yet instead of making him happy, Joshua felt crushed. He became depressed and isolated. He felt as if his life was over. Sin got a hold of him, and the devil dragged him down till there seemed no hope. But when Joshua was at his worst, God came searching for him. On Easter Sunday, 2015, Joshua was invited to a church where he heard the gospel for the first time. Joshua Broom gave his life to Jesus and received the forgiveness of sins that only Christ can give. But he wasn't just forgiven. He was changed. Listen to his words. That moment changed my life, Joshua said. I was able to relinquish not just the shame and the guilt from pornography, but the shame and the guilt from feeling like I wasn't good enough my entire life. Today, Joshua Broom is married 
and has three children. He is a full-time pastor, and he travels around the USA telling others about how God saved him and turned his life around, how God's grace forgave him and made him righteous. For you see, God can save even the worst sinner and make him new. No matter how far you are from God or how great the barrier between you and God, Jesus has come to save you and change you. He's come to make you truly righteous from the inside out. That's the powerful truth in our final scripture for today, found in Romans 5, 17 to 19. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater, greater than the sin, greater than the death, greater than the condemnation, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who will receive it. All who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. And if that free gift comes to you and you receive it, you will live in victory over sin. The chain of pornography will be broken. The chain of masturbation will be broken. The chain of fornication will be broken. God's gift of righteousness is greater than the power of sin and death. And when you receive it by faith, you will live in victory over sin. That's my prayer for you. I pray today that you will know God's truth. I pray that you will discover it in the Bible, that you will understand that righteousness is beyond your reach, but it's not unreachable. Jesus came so you could live a righteous life. It's a free gift you receive when you respond to him. It comes by faith, and when it comes, it changes you and results in righteous living. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every man and woman, boy and girl, listening or watching today. I pray that you will convince them of the truth. For those who feel condemned and trapped and bound by habits of sin that they can't break free from. Right now, I'm speaking to someone. You're bound by pornography or masturbation. You're caught in a relationship of adultery or fornication. Right now, to someone bound by lies, bound by rebellion, bound by stealing. I break those curses upon you and I say to you today, if you will open up your heart and reach out to Jesus, he will save you. Lord Jesus, come in and touch that life today. Come and deliver them and break the bondage of sin. Lord, change us, not just to get us to heaven, not just to make our life better, but change us so that we become like you. Let righteousness be displayed in us. Let us be like Zacchaeus, that everyone around us will see your power at work in us to transform our lives. Lord, we need a revival of righteousness. I pray right now for every Christian, every church, everyone, oh God, listening to me, I pray that you will revive righteousness in us, change us, and save us, and transform us. Lord, I pray you'll convict and deal with everyone who goes to church, even those who preach the gospel, but they're living in sin. Lord, change us today. Grip us with the reality of your truth. Let us draw near to you. Let us be to you like Jeff was to me, never leaving my side, always looking up to me. Let us always stay close to you. Let us stay in the light so that the power, the power of God, the power to save, the power to transform us will flow in our lives. I loose your power upon your people today, and by faith we receive it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. God richly bless you and keep close to Jesus. Stay in the light and you'll stay in victory. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to build your life on God's Word. God's Word is the only truth you can build your life upon. Thank you for watching Truth For Today with Pastor Whitcomb. There are many life-changing sermon videos by Pastor Whitcomb you can watch or download for free. Simply visit youtube.com to find Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb's YouTube channel and subscribe. You can also find sermon notes and daily devotionals for this and other sermons by visiting Pastor Whitcomb's website at pastorrichardcwhitcomb.com. See, there's nothing too hard for God. No problem he can't solve. Nothing he can't fix. Nothing he cannot do. Receive daily inspiration by following Pastor Whitcomb on Twitter at RevRCW. Like and follow Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb on Facebook.com and Instagram at Pastor Richard C. Whitcomb for more inspiration. Let us know how this webcast has changed your life. Send us an email to pastor.whitcomb at agapehousegana.org. 
send your prayer request to prayer at agapehousegana.org. When you're busy, you consume your time with activity. You can also help other people see this video by donating to help promote this webcast. Just visit www.pastorrichardcwhitcomb.com to donate. Thank you and God bless you.